Oh. Hi, Otis. Sir, I have the research results. We have airliners leading attack formations, a flying boat, a Gundam-like transport aircraft, an Antism aircraft resembling an AWACS and one of the strangest looking turboprop ever seen, sir. Um, what about the sources this time? I used a book, this time, sir. Uh, Otis, you have no hands. I asked the cleaner to flip the book for me, sir. Did she? I was very convincing, sir. So here's the thing, with the fall of the Soviet Union, the Russian armed forces went through a period of, let's say, confusion. It would probably take an entire long video to describe in some details all the changes and the reforms that happened between 1991 and the present day. Today the Russian aerospace forces are much smaller than they used to be, but arguably much more efficient. In particular, during the 2010, there has been a large modernization effort where uh, new aircraft have been introduced and the older ones have been upgraded. In this process, precedence has been given to the thief, so to speak, and it's left some niches where some creative solutions have been adopted. For this reason, some particularly interesting aircraft are in service with the Russian Air Force and they are almost unknown in the West. So, without further ado, here are five Russian aircraft that you probably didn't know they existed. In the fifth place, we have an airliner, the Tupolev 134. It is a narrow body aircraft originally designed in the 60s. It has been built in over 800 units and it has been in service in a lot of airlines around the world. The production ended in 1989, so the number of uh, 2134 currently in service is progressively reducing. During these years, the aircraft served in many roles other than civilian transport and there have been quite a lot of adaptations. For example, there are training versions for the crews of the Tupolev 160 and the Tupolev 22, where the nose cone of the aircraft has been replaced with the nose cone of the bombers. However, the Russian Aerospace Forces have about 50 of them still in service. About 20 of them are with the 8th Division of Special Purple. This is a mixed transport unit that is also operating other airliners and various transport aircraft. So the Tupolev 134 main mission is to transport personnel within the country and abroad. In particular, since 2015, these aircraft have transported most of the personnel going back and forth from Syria. But going back and forth from Syria it also had another crucial mission. Many Russian aircraft do not have civilian transponders. This means that they may even not show up in some of the air traffic control systems. The Tupolev 134 had to lead these military aircraft, Su-35s, Su-34s, Su-24s and anything else, through the airspace of other friendly countries to avoid interference with the civilian traffic. And this resulted in the quite rare occurrence of an airliner leading an air superiority or an attack package. And by the way, one of the reasons why the Norwegians or the British follow the Russian bombers that fly down from the Arctic Sea into the Atlantic is because uh, these aircraft do not have transponders and so a uh, NATO aircraft can mark their position and avoid uh, problems with the civilian traffic. Okay, everybody knows that there are no longer flying boats in service with any naval aviation around the world. The last one was the Japanese Shinmeiwa US-1A, which has been retired in 2017. Uh, yes, I know they have the Shinmeiwa US-2, but that is just a search and rescue aircraft. It is not a maritime patrol platform. Anyway, this is not true. The Russian 318th 
Composite Aviation Regiment flying from Chaka near Sevastopol in Crimea is still flying the Beriev 12 flying bow. The Beriev 12 is an old aircraft, it actually entered service in the early 60s and its appearance is definitely not the best. Uh, the aircraft is quite ugly and probably a good representative of the Soviet design philosophy. It was originally designed as an anti-submarine aircraft but today is also used in the secondary role of search and rescue. The peculiarity of the Beriev 12 is that the entire rear section of the fuselage and the tail empennages are all built with non-magnetic materials. This is because it features a tail boom with a magnetic anomalies detector. It is a system that detects changes in the planetary magnetic field caused by a large mass of metal like a submarine for example. It is a short range but very precise system to locate a submarine underwater. But since an aircraft has metallic parts too, the MAD requires an accurate calibration to avoid interference from the aircraft itself and failing to do so greatly reduces the accuracy of the sensor. This is common practice but the Soviets used a more radical approach. They just kept all the magnetic materials as far as possible from the MAD. Even the crew is prohibited of bringing anything magnetic in the real part of the fuselage. Another peculiarity of the Beriev 12 is that it is designed to settle on water and start searching with its own sonar. Yes, because a hull mounted sonar is probably more effective than the conventional sonar buoys used by any other aircraft. However, this makes the Beriev 12 the only aircraft in the world that can be attacked by torpedoes. Another peculiarity of the Beriev 12, uh, despite the appearance that definitely doesn't suggest outstanding performances, is the fact that it still holds a lot of world records for the category of amphibian aircraft, particularly in terms of climb rates. The nine aircraft in service with 318th Regiment are quite old and worn down, so probably their days are numbered. However, it is definitely an unusual asset, so it was worth adding to our list. The Antonov 72 is a tactical transport in the 10 tons class that flew for the first time in Soviet times in 1977. It was designed to operate from very short and unprepared runways and is still quite common in various air forces and also for civilian use. Ok, with this aircraft, the obvious elephant in the room Ok, with this aircraft the obvious elephant in the room is the position! <laughs> so the noticeable element, in, no elephant, is the position of the engines above the wing. In an aircraft like this, this configuration has the important advantage of keeping the air intake far from the ground and well ahead of the undercarriage. If operating from a gravel or a dirt airstrip, in this way the air intake is well out of the way of any foreign debris. But this particular position also has the advantage of creating a twisting a moment on the wing that is contrasting the aerodynamic twisting moments. In fact, a wing in flight is subject to a twisting torque and it must be designed to be stiff enough to contrast it. If the wing twists in an uncontrolled manner, well, what happens is that the local angle of attack of each section of the wing actually increases. The drag increases too and the tip of the wing will be the most twisted part of the entire wing. And a twisted tip is something that you don't want. Ailerons are placed at the tip of the wing to increase their effectiveness. But if the tip of the wing is twisted, hence it is closer to stall, if the wing should stall, the tip of the wing will stall first and the ailerons will lose effectiveness first. 
This is something that the pilot doesn't want. The pilot wants to keep control of the aircraft as long as possible. Another interesting advantage is that the jet exhaust increases the wing speed above one section of the wing. Increasing the speed reduces the pressure, hence the lift of that section of the wing actually increases. It is a welcome lift addition, but you also have to consider that you may have the necessity of adding some heat resistant materials above the wings, hence adding some weight, sort of compensating this extra lift. Yes, everything in life is a trade-off. Obviously, there are also disadvantages with this configuration, and an important one is the fact that the engines are not readily accessible for maintenance. And for a tactical machine, this is quite an important issue. However, whatever the design compromise that was achieved, the machine had quite a reasonable success, and there is one variant which is particularly interesting. The Antonov 72P is not a transport version. It is an aircraft in service with the Russian Border Guard service in about 10 units. Now, usually a border patrol aircraft is equipped with a range of sensors for maritime and ground surveillance. Well, in Russia it's not the case. Or better, the aircraft features a number of sensors, but it also has a 23mm cannon pod, two underwing pylon, each one capable of up to 650 kilos of bombs and rockets, and it can also drop 100 kilos bombs from the rear of the aircraft. So I personally would say that it is not an AC-130, but it is in the right way. The Illusion 38 is a maritime anti-submarine aircraft that flew for the first time in 1967. It is a heavily modified version of the Illusion 18 turboprop transport. Its configuration, story and employment is very similar to the P3C Orion aircraft and probably the superficial observer could definitely mix the two aircraft. In the early 2000s, building on the experience of the SD variant, which was an export variant for the Indian Navy, the aircraft was modernized and it received the Novella system to bring its capabilities up to date. And to be honest, the update program has been quite slow. There are about 30 aircraft in service and not all of them has been uh, uh, brought to the new standard yet. The Novella system replaced the previous Berkut system. It is a fully digital, integrated combat system and it features pretty much everything you would expect on a modern anti-submarine warfare system. There is a radar, there is a mat, there is a flare, uh, the aircraft is equipped with sonobuoys, uh, it can fire depth charges, uh, torpedoes, also anti-ship missiles and so on. But I'm sure that you didn't miss the strange contraption on top of the cockpit. If you thought that the aircraft was a NOAX, well, you are forgiven. However, there is no radar there. The box contains an electronic surveillance system which is deemed to be quite advanced. For example, the aircraft is equipped with a relatively powerful radar for identifying surface targets and to give the targeting information to the anti-ship missiles. The electronic surveillance system is believed to be accurate enough to provide a fully passive firing solution to the anti-ship missiles. And in fact, since the upgrade, the aircraft tend to be used also in an electronic intelligence role, which seems to be an additional primary mission. And in this respect, again, is not different from the latest versions of the Orion. Before moving to number one, I believe that the Illusion 96 400M deserves an honorable mention. The aircraft was designed to be a civilian white body uh, to compete with the Boeing 777 or the Airbus 350. It definitely did not succeed in this endeavor, but the two prototypes that have been built are going to be completed and modified to become flying common posts, or in press parlance, doomsday planes. The aircraft is obviously going to be much more modern than the aging fleet of Illusion 80, which is currently in service. 
even because the Illusion 80 is famous for the fact that a few years ago, while one of these aircraft was parked for maintenance, some burglars broke into the aircraft and stole something. But probably this is a story for a different video. The Illusion 22 is a bizarre aircraft. It entered service in 2016 and only three units have been delivered so far. They were actually built modifying Illusion 18 transports, adding these strange nacelles on the side of the aircraft. Today they are in service with the 117th Military Air Transport Regiment. Now, obviously these nacelles contain antennas and very, very powerful antennas. Yes, because the Illusion 22 is an aircraft designed to shut down opponents' radars and big radars like those one installed on OWACs or the ground-based surveillance radars. Do you remember the nacelles installed on the EF-111 or on the E-6 Prowler? Well, this one has four of them. The system is called L415 and it is believed to be a high power, wide spectrum jammer. And its mission is to blanket an entire area with electronic interference to basically shut down everything that has an antenna. Again, this is very Russian and it is an example of the focus that the Russian armed forces had on electronic warfare in the last three decades. The peculiarity of this system is that it can network with the ground-based system that the Russians use to either defend fixed positions or to accompany uh, ground units on the battlefield. The objective is obviously optimizing the use of every available jammer and not to overjam anything. The Idushin 22 is considered a stopgapper for the Russians and they are developing an entirely new system which is expected for around 2025-2026. And to better understand how the Russian electronic systems are effective even though they are quite different from their western counterparts, please watch the videos that are going to appear beside me where we cover the systems of the Skoit 57 in quite detail. Now. Thank you very much for watching and see you there.